Hello and welcome to News Central Now with me, Blessings Musugu. The top stories at this hour. Communities continue to accuse security operatives of killing residents during NBAD governance protests. Tanzania police arrest opposition figure Tundu Lisu in mass roundup. Families flee countries northeast as wildfire rages in Algeria. We have the details in a moment. News now begins with political issues. The Senate on Sunday tackled former President Olusegun Obasanjo over his comment that lawmakers in both chambers of the National Assembly fix their salaries. Now, in a statement, Senate spokesman Yemi Adaramudu challenged anyone with credible evidence to present contrary facts. Adaramudu said the raid chamber only receives a salary allocated to it by the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Fiscal Commission in line with the Constitution. The lawmaker, who represents Ikiti South Senatorial District in the 10th NAS, also emphasized that no senator has received any financial patronage from the presidency. And now joining us on the news to talk about this is Dr. Jide Johnson, a public affairs analyst. Thank you so much, Dr. Jide Johnson, for joining us. Yes, all over the world. All right, uh, Dr. Jide, now the former president, Olusha Gwambasanjo, in his comment did say that lawmakers in both the chambers of the National Assembly fix their salaries, even though the Senate spokesman, Adara Modu, has refuted this. What do you make of all of that? Well, um, if, this, if Senator Ningi, who happens to be a senator representing Bauchi, um, could accuse the Senate of budget padding, and then he was summarily suspended, uh, how much more uh, will you think about them fixing their salaries and allowances, even though that core function is the core function of the Revenue and Fiscal Mobilization Committee, uh, which is the committee that fixes the salaries of all public elected officials and other public servants. And so it's not out of place. Abbasanjo must not, uh, President Abbasanjo must not have spoken out of, out of place of ignorance. He must... You must be privy to some certain information which you and I might not be privy to, which, uh, you know, the whole of National Assembly is run under secrecy. You don't even know what is going on within the National Assembly. And so if Obasanjo could come out boldly and accuse the uh, National Assembly of fixing their salaries and the rest of it, it's, you know, fall on the National Assembly to come to town with whatever they are collecting in terms of releasing their, their, their pay slip for Nigerians to see. After all, they are representing the Nigerian people. They are elected to serve the interests of the Nigerian people. So they should show us their peace slip to, to discountenance what President Obasanjo has said. Right. Now, um, what implications do you think could be there for public trust and legislative integrity if it were proven that the lawmakers actually had the ability to set their own salaries? Well, um, the, the question we need to ask, what is public trust in the National Assembly? What is the public trust in in the political class. You see, the public trust in the political class is at its lowest ebb. Who, who, who has confidence in the National Assembly, which is meant to be the actual representative of the people, representing them? Are they representing our interests or are they representing their interests? All you just need to do is just to go to town do, and do an opinion poll. And I, and I can tell you that the National Assembly, in terms of credibility and trust index, will not get, less, will not get up to 35% in terms of the polling you get, because the confidence level of an average Nigerian in the National Assembly is at its lowest ebb, considering the way and manner in which the National Assembly over time has conducted itself. You, you look at this present National Assembly led by the Senate President, you, you've seen that he, he's gotten himself enmeshed in one form of controversy or the other. Let's talk about the Ningi issue concerning Senator Ningi's um, accusation of budget padding, or we talk about... Um, mm, um, Senator Ndumes, the way Senator Ndumes' issue was handled, or you talk about the one that the Senate President actually apologized for, for calling a, 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 a senator representing Kogi, Kogi Central, and not to, to think that the Senate is, 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 is a clubber. So, invariably, the Senate, the, Senate the, the National Assembly has shot itself in the foot in terms of the way they've conducted themselves in the last few years. Mm. Um, I'm kind of curious to know what the potential impact would be on governance and on transparency if 
at all the suggestion by Obasanjo, you know, to have the RMAFC set their salaries, uh, the lawmaker salaries exclusively, if that were implemented, what implications should we be expecting? The implication is that Nigeria does not have confidence and trust in the National Assembly to represent their interests. And then you need public trust in public governance. Once that trust is, is out of place, then there, there is no confidence in whatever you are doing, and invariably it affects the image of, of, of the government, and then it eventually affects the output of those that you have elected into public office. Are they serving the interest of the people? Are they serving their own? Are they serving their own, their own, their own interest? As far as an average Nigerian is concerned, they lack confidence in the, in the entire system which we have concerning the democratic structure we have at the National Assembly. Are the National Assembly members representing the interests of their constituents or they are representing their own selfish interests? In what way are they serving our interests? In what way are they doing the oversight function? In what way are they representing the interests of their various constituents to ensure that the various constituents are not left out beyond their own salaries and wages? As far as an average Nigerian is concerned, they are just there to represent their own interests and not to represent the interests of an average Nigerian. Are they making laws for the good and betterment of the country? Are they carrying out their oversight function for the good and betterment of the country? It's, only, it's always things that are of paramount interest to themselves that they address to. Look at the issue of uh, when we are talking about minimum wages and when we are talking about whether they should, they should purchase expensive cars as their official car. You know, that itself damages the reputation of the National Assembly. And in democracy, image is very, very important. Public confidence and trust in democratic structure is important for the sustenance of democracy and development in the society. All right, uh, Dr. Jide Johnson, a public affairs analyst, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your thoughts. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. A pleasure as well. All right, some more stories now. Nigeria's opposition People's Democratic Party has accused the former governor of Edo State and member of the All Progressives Congress, Adams Oshomole, of deliberating or deliberately misleading citizens of Edo State over candidateship status of the PDP governorship candidate of the state. Now, the PDP spokesperson says that the lawmaker and former governor deliberately misrepresented a recent court judgment in order to deceive citizens of the state. Amadine Oyi reports. It was a short briefing by the spokesperson of the opposition People's Democratic Party. The spokesperson accused the All Progressives Congress of deliberately misleading citizens ahead of the Edo State governorship poll, especially in relation to a recent court ruling which the APC claimed disqualified its candidates for the upcoming Edo State governorship poll. What Comrade Adams O'Shomole did is reprehensible and is condemnable. Coming to the National TV to lie. This is the court judgment, the court of appeal. And the judgment was rendered on the 22nd day of July. And just for emphasis, I'll just read a particular part of the that judgment to you, which was the last concluding part of it by the, by the presiding judge. It says, in view of the resolution of all issues, all, all issues, and I will come to the background of that, for determination against the appellant, it follows that this appeal lacks merit and it ought to and is hereby dismissed. He challenged the APC to present its candidate for a debate. We want a debate. That is the essence of democracy. We are mirroring America according to us in our process. Right now, the president candidates are suggesting three debates in September, in one month. Now, we have an equivalent who will not commit to. But interestingly, we have information that a national outlet, a TV station, has invited him for tomorrow, Monday. And we're saying to him, it is in his interest, it's in the interest of Edo State people, that he comes out to appear in that show so that people can ask questions that is agitating the Edo people, and of course Nigeria, to know indeed what manner of character of people seek to public office. The PDP spokesperson also accused the All Progressives Congress of being unprepared for the poll, but trying to distract citizens of the state. In Abuja for New Central, I am 
Amadin Uyi. And now to update on the hashtag end bad governance, residents of Gaskia Den Magaji area of Zaria in Kaduna state have accused security operatives of shooting indiscriminately and killing some youths in their community while enforcing the 24-hour curfew imposed on the city a few days ago. The residents told the New Central television crew that army personnel killed two youths in the community. They called for an explanation from the Nigerian army. The general officer commanding Division 1 of the Nigerian Army, however, promised to investigate the allegations and present his findings soon. Some of the Maya Katasuki was Gurumutane, Akanganya, Achebala, Tarahanya, Bala, Toshahanyaba. When I had the Tiagas, one of my Haribi, Anga Bojama, the Dama, the Anka Kashusu, one of the Basa Galu, Kodi Tokokana, the Galu, Mabe, and Pani, and Nigeria. In the Kaba, on you, Usa Babanka, and Usabani, and Nigeria. Who is the Telaka, Nigeria, Bamadoni, and see Magana Haribi, Koda Karibi, Yazogan Daiki, a common attendant to Zero Taganiva. Yazatana Nat, Chin Tap to Daiki Koi, Fiat Sashi, and what I have now twenty. Now, a former presidential candidate, Peter Obi, has expressed his deepest condolences to the families of those who lost their lives during the recent hashtag end bad governance protests. In a statement released on X on Sunday, Obi mourned the loss of lives, including security personnel who died during the demonstrations. He also wished a speedy recovery to those injured during the protests and assured them that their sacrifices would not be forgotten. Meanwhile, parents of victims of the end bad governance protests in some states have appealed for the prosecution of security operatives who shot at protesters during the demonstrations in the state. Earlier on, we were joined on the news by Samuel Olukade, a legal practitioner. Weapons under any guise does not have a place in a protest, in any form of protest in the 21st century, provided the protest is said to be peaceful. I mean, weapons should not have, uh, weapon, weapons under any guise should not have a place. Everybody knows that the, uh, the security operatives take orders from the government of the day. So, we are, I mean, like uh, in my own area, we had instances where protesters were arrested. I mean, protesters were arrested. Indiscriminate force were used on protesters. And we had reasons to engage the security operatives. And they told us that their hands, uh, their hands were tied because the order to arrest and uh, violate the rights of these protesters came from above. That is on the one hand. There is also the problem of the leadership of the security operatives. In the, of the, I mean, sorry, the rank and file of the security operatives in the sense that first, the rank and file of the security operatives are Nigerians before they are security operatives. So one would expect that as reasonable Nigerians, they are expected to identify with the masses in the when once these protests begin and uh, in the spirit of being reasonable i would expect that even if they are the the authorities or their bosses expect them to use unreasonable force on protesters they are expected to restrain themselves from the use of this force of course we've had good uh, reports of a uh, of a uh, of a uh, security operatives like the ones in the, the ones in those states that had reasons to to, to even distribute water to the protesters in a bid to show that they were with them. Those are good reports. You're still live with us on the news. We go on a short break now, and when we come back, more stories. Stay with us. Many thanks for staying with us. Now, going to more stories, Governor Caleb Mutfuang of Plateau State has assured that his administration would not keep mute in addressing the challenges of the present economic hardship as it bothers on the people of Plateau State. 
The governor, who spoke at the first ever town hall with leaders of a youth coalition on the plateau, acknowledged the sad situation but pledged to turn things around. Now, he called for patience and the understanding of citizens on the plateau while measures unfold in tackling the challenges. News Central's Chizoba Anyowe tells us more. It was the governor's first time meeting with such youth leaders since assuming office in May 2023. With heavy hearts, these youths thronged the Little Rayfield government house to present their agitation and seek ways of reversing the biting economy of Nigeria. Your Excellency, there is an occasion to build this movement and uh, to not stop within the plateau, but to cause it to cascade over the nation. But actually, we can live as a people, Muslims, Christians, and traditionalists, irrespective of your faith, we can live together and build a civility. Accountability for federal funds allocation. We request a full account of how the 26 billion euro allocated to Kansas State by the federal government two weeks ago has been utilized. If the funds have not yet been expended, we request that the government promptly release a detailed spending plan to the public. There are people who you have asked them to vacate the streets, but there's no alternative for them. We ask that the government of Plateau State look into this. We created a space for people who are doing their businesses in terminals. We ask that people who are doing their businesses in other places that have been asked to vacate, the government should provide an alternative place for them to also do their business. Receiving the Memorandum for Action and Charter of Demands of the Just Hashtag End Bad Governance Coalition, Governor Mutfang promised to forward same to the President for further actions. That the years 2015 to 2023 were the years when Nigerians and Nigeria were stripped of the dignity of humanity and we moved from one of the biggest economies in Africa to the poverty capital of the world. These were the years when the locusts ate our wealth. These were the years when the fault lines of our divides were heightened. These were the years when corruption became a culture. And we are coming at a time when things are really bad. And I agree with you totally that the time has come, and the time is now, when we must change the story of our nation. The presentation was made by these leaders of youth movements in the state, in the presence of the cabinet members of the state government. They praised security agencies on the plateau for their display of professionalism during and after the protest for the general maintenance of peace in plateau state. In Jaws for New Central, Chizoba and Yui. Now, in a significant development aimed at enhancing operational efficiency, the Nigerian Army has inaugurated a new theater training school and upgraded an existing one at the May Malari Military Cantonment in Maiduguri. Now, Major General Y.D. Shwaibu, a theater commander in Northeast JTF Operation, Harding Kai, says... The facilities are expected to play a crucial role in advancing the combat skills of troops. News Central's Umoru Kirawa completes the report. A graduation ceremony of these soldiers whose capabilities have been enhanced in response to evolving security challenges. To further bolster the morale of soldiers and future trainees, the Nigerian army taught it wise to upgrade its training school and establish a new one. The commissioning of this new training school represents a major investment in the future of Northeast Joint Task Force operations with the sole aim of returning normalcy to the Northeast Theater of Operation. It is a testament that Theater Command is committed to providing our personnel with the best possible training facilities in line with the strategic guidance of the Chief of Army Staff. 
Let me, at this point, express my profound appreciation and gratitude to the Chief of Army staff who made this project possible. The new school will provide enhanced training in counterinsurgency operations crucial for the ongoing fight against Boko Haram. And why I urge you to maintain the highest standards of professionalism and integrity in everything you do. Let us commit to upholding the values as we strive for excellence and integrity in our training, in our service, and in our lives. The challenges we face in our training are not obstacles, but stepping stones to greater proficiency and preparedness. The renovated facility now features a conducive learning environment and resources designed to better prepare soldiers for the complexities of modern warfare. We did the train the trainers course, whereby uh, some of these troops that we are trained this morning will go back to their various units and formations to continue training others, because constantly there is in theater training in preparing the troops for what they are achieving. So I believe it will impact positively on their output in the field. The establishment of the new facility and the enhancement of the existing training center will not only improve the tactical and strategic skills of army personnel, but provides a pathway for ending the age-old security concerns in the region. In Maiduguri for New Central, Omaru Kirawa. Now, uh, Aba, as the commercial center of the southeast in Algeria in recent times have witnessed a setback in its commercial activities on Mondays due to the seat at homes. Now, this was necessitated by the declaration of a protest by some non-state actors to register their displeasure over the arrest of the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, Namdi Kanu, some years back. It's a Sunday, and Aba, a Christian town, is in full business in some local markets. Residents care less if it's a Sunday. It's not about covering up. I do come out on Sundays before. Oh, I'm not scared to come out on Mondays. Rather, for the love of Namde, I stay at home. Ever since they hold him there, I don't come out on Mondays. That's the promise I made to myself. I don't know him in person, but I listen to him. As the world advances technologically, particularly in agriculture, genetically motivated organisms, GMOs, are becoming more common in our food supply. But some reports have suggested that there are risks associated with GMO foods. Now, in this report, New Central's Bettina Mweli looks at these risks and how Nigeria can navigate the challenges that they present. Genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, are plants or animals whose genetic makeup has been altered through biotechnology to enhance desirable traits, such as resistance to pests or improved nutritional content. While GMOs offer potential benefits, they also come with concerns that need careful consideration. The tests that are usually done by, pro, by, by governments, by agencies that are promoting GMOs, don't last more than 90 days. And people are not going to eat GMOs for only 90 days, and they say, okay, we've done it this far. You could, you could take something, eat or drink, a particular thing, it will take years before the impact will begin to show. This very reason is why, like in Nigerian law and in many other GMO laws, they don't permit, they don't include strict liability. One primary concern is the potential health risks. Critics argue that GMOs could trigger allergic reactions or other health issues. While many studies suggest GMOs are safe, public skepticism remains. So if they're so convinced, like we hear the Nigerian Biosafety Management Agency always say the GMOs we approve are safe. The GMOs we are, we approve are safe. There is no reason to take them for the, on their wall. Let them prove it. Let them bring the risk assessment and publish it. Some scientists have done tests that last more than 90 days and they've, they've been blackmailed and pressured. So the, the, the truth is that there's no consensus globally about the safety or otherwise of GMOs. 
As Nigeria continues to navigate the complexities of GMO food consumption, it is important to approach these innovations with caution and a commitment to safety. This includes transparent labeling and information on the benefits and risks. Secondly, ensuring that GMOs are tested thoroughly for safety and environmental impact before they enter the market, as well as supporting farmers with training and resources can help them make informed decisions about adopting the GMO technology. By balancing progress with prudent measures, Nigeria can make informed choices that benefit both its people and its environment. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Nwili. Coming up on the news, families flee countries northeast as wildfire rages in Algeria. We'll bring you the details after the break. Thanks for staying with us on the news. A Tanzanian police have detained leading opposition Chadema party figures, including former presidential candidate Tundu Lisu, and rounded up several hundred youth supporters. The Chadema leaders were arrested in the southwestern city of Mbeya, where the party was due to hold a rally on Monday to mark International Youth Day. Chadema's Director of Communications and Foreign Affairs said that around 500 youth supporters had also been arrested by police as they were making their way to the Mbeya gathering and were being escorted back home. Tanzanian police had announced a ban on the Chadema youth gathering accusing the party of planning violent demonstrations. To more stories now, Rwanda's President Paul Kagame has been sworn in for a fourth term after a landslide victory in last month's elections. The ceremony was attended by dozens of African heads of state and dignitaries at a packed stadium in Kigali. President Kagame took the oath of office, pledging to preserve peace and national sovereignty. He won the election with an overwhelming 99.18% of the vote, according to the National Electoral Commission. Rights activists have criticized the lack of democracy in the country, with only two candidates authorized to run against him. The Democratic Green Party leader, Frank Habineza, came in second with just 0.5% of the vote, while independent candidate Felipe Impayimana received 0.32%. Now, Algerian firefighters have been battling blazes in the northeastern Kabyle region as families were ordered to evacuate. Residents were told to leave homes in the fire's path in Tizi Uzo province, though it was not immediately clear how many people were affected. Numerous wildfires have broken out in Tizi Uzo since Friday, though most of them have been brought under control or were expected to soon. Authorities in Beijia province near Tizi Uzo ordered the evacuation of around 20 families from Mizora village, which is located near a forest where blazes raged on Sunday. En même temps, on va, on va prévenir, c'est-à-dire que ça ne va pas endommager les, les, hab les habitants, les habitants, les habitants, les habitants, les n'importe quoi. Still ahead, pilot dies as helicopter smashes into hotel roof in Australia. We'll bring you the details after the break.
Now to World Wrap. In northern Australia, a helicopter crashed into the roof of a Hilton hotel on Monday, killing the pilot and igniting a fiery explosion on the building's roof. Hundreds of patrons were evacuated from the double tree by Hilton in the tropical tourist hub of Cairns after the twin-engine helicopter crashed around 1.50 a.m. local time. The police, who was the sole passenger in the helicopter, the pilot rather, died at the scene. Two people who were staying in a room close to where the aircraft crashed were hospitalized for smoke inhalation. Woke up from this loud crash sounding like a bomb or something, honestly. Um, and then a bit dazed, waking up at two in the morning and yeah. then suddenly all the alarms start going off and I thought it was a fire or yeah. something at first, but... And all commotion. evacuate, the police yelling, get out, get out, get out. And then start seeing all the flames rising up the side of the building and, yeah. I mean, I think people were just shocked. I think people were just like, didn't know what to do. And, I mean, tired days. Tired days. I mean, some people, they, you know, were still stirring about and they just, yeah. It was a bit of a weird, I mean, the whole, whole experience is a bit crazy, actually. Well, I had a very loud bang. Sound woke me up and uh, when I went and looked out at the window... Uh, I could see huge big flames on the top of the building and uh, then it started to die down so I grabbed my phone and took a short film of the flames dying down. Now Greece ordered thousands of people to evacuate as firefighters battled a spate of wildfires and experts warned of more extreme weather to come next week. Firefighters were battling a dangerous fire near Athens on Sunday night with smoke covering parts of the capital in a dark haze. The emergency services issued evacuation orders in several towns, including the historic site of Marathon. The authorities ordered residents of the historic town of Marathon, 40 kilometers east of Athens, to evacuate towards the beach town of Nia Makri because of a wildfire burning since Sunday afternoon. <laughs> από ελιές που φέτος γίνανε και χρονιά τους για λάδι τώρα τι θα γίνει δεν γνωρίζουμε από εδώ και πέρα δεν ξέρουμε αν θα σταματήσει πότε θα σταματήσει η φωτιά έχει πάρα πολύ μεγάλο μέτωπο είναι πάνω από 30-40 χιλιόμετρα το μέτωπο από εκεί που ξεκίνησε μέχρι εκεί που έχει φτάσει είναι πάρα πολύ μεγάλο δεν ελέγχεται με τίποτα Σέναν ότι όλη η περιοχή που κάει και εδώ πέρα Καπανδρίτη ε, ήταν ελαιόδεντρα, ήταν αγροτική περιοχή δηλαδή όλοι οι κάτοικοι εδώ της περιοχής έχουν εδώ ελιές, έχουν αμπέλια ε, όλα ήταν εδώ πέρα κάτω αυτά έχουν καεί όλα, έχουν καταστραφεί όλα και είναι η περιοχή που έχουν καεί όλα, έχουν καταστραφεί όλα όλες οι ελιές, όλα τα αμπέλια, ελαιώνες, πάρα πολλά δέντρα, χιλιάδες δέντρα καταστραφεί κανόλα, καεί κανόλα δεν υπάρχει... Now, the history of China, which dates back to over 2,000 years, would be incomplete without the mention of some invasions which underscores the country's emergency to greatness. Now, China has successfully transformed the relics of those incidents to huge attraction for visitors and citizens alike. This next report takes us to the forbidding city and the Great Wall of China. On a bright Friday morning in the month of August, thousands of visitors troop down this path. The destination is the ancient city called Forbidden. It is located in the center of the imperial city of Beijing. <laughs> Students and other holiday makers determined to savour what makes this place revered for centuries. This city was built within 14 years between 1406 and 1420. It sits on a 72-hectare space and is surrounded by a 9.9-metre wall. There are over 900 rooms here. From the reign of Emperor Chu Di, who built the city, commoners were not allowed freely in there. Key element of that era is that the emperor's power could not be challenged. These contributed in giving the forbidden title to the city. Forbidden city suffered so much in history. Now, first, uh, first time in 1860, 
Anglo and French Allied Force invaded China. They launched the Second Opium War. Forbidden City was born by fire. Okay, almost all the treasures were robbed by them. So if you like to if you like to watch Chinese treasures, I recommend you go to British Museum. <laughs> they are so much. Okay, Chinese vision. After some invasions in the 17th century, successive leadership in the country ensured the preservation of the city as a reminder for the future generations of where they are coming from. Getting information from officials here was difficult due to language barrier, but it was gathered that during holidays like the summer, the city receives hundreds of thousands of visitors daily and even the light midday shower was not enough to deter them. At the other end of Beijing city stands the Great Wall of China, listed as one of the wonders of the world. The over 21 kilometer wall was constructed in 7th century BC. It stretches along the ancient northern border as a means of protecting the territory from rampaging nomadic groups. The most popular parts of the world were built between 1368 and 1644. More than 2,000 years after the building of the wall started, the Chinese have not forgotten how much the wall contributed to their survival. The Great Wall is a symbol of China, yeah? I think each one knows this place. Okay, now speaking of the Great Wall, can be traced the 7th century BC. At that time, China was divided into seven kingdoms, same to Europe. Okay, in order to defend the enemy from neighbors, all the kingdoms built a long wall around their frontiers. These walls were today's Great Wall's base. This inscription says, you are not a hero if you have not been to the wall. For people from different parts of the world, visiting this place means the same thing. It's quite big and steep, and there are a lot of people. Oh, it was, it's amazing. I like the place, and I wanted to visit, and uh, I'm here, and I'm glad. The people here, it's amazing, the culture, and also the food is wonderful. Every, uh, all the people, it's so kind. Then it's a really good experience, and being here, it's amazing. I think it's one of the most wonderful places I have ever seen in my life. Before getting to the wall, every visitor, children and adults alike, share in the same experience of walking up the hill, even before the cable car now intervenes. Mao Zedong is known as the father of modern China. This statue stands in the middle of the Orange Island in Changsha district of Henan province. Built in two years between 2007 and 2009, the monument is 32 meters tall and 41 meters wide, signifying the number of years the man popularly referred to as Chairman Mao led the Chinese Communist Party. All the way from the entrance, hundreds of people are conveyed in sightseeing vehicles and a lot more walking on foot to share in the memory of the man whose dream triggered the birth of what China has become. That's the statue of Chairman Mao, Comrade Mao Zedong. And this statue, it's uh, made of uh, naval stone. And that, when he was uh, 32 years old. So the way he is looking at is the eastern way. That's where the sun rises. Then also, that's where his university located. It's also on that way. In almost every part of China, there is a preserved pointer to the country's journey towards the superpower it has become. A lesson for the present, which is that behind the glory and glamour of today are hard work and determination of yesterday. And now to business. The government of Zambia announced over the weekend that it had temporarily closed its borders with the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This action could cause a delay in exports from the continent's largest producer of copper. Zambia's Minister of Commerce, Trade and Industry, Chipoka Mulenga, on Saturday night, announced the closure. The move follows protests in Congo that fled after the government of that country banned certain beverage imports from Zambia 
Z and BC reported. Molanga didn't provide a time frame on how long the government will keep the border closed. Now, most of Congo's copper travels through Zambia to reach regional ports. To sports now, Nigeria's women under-17 national team, the Flamingos, will commence their preparations ahead of their participation at the 2024 FIFA Under-17 Women's World Cup Finals. This was revealed on Sunday by a Nigerian Football Federation official. The 2024 FIFA Under-17 Women's World Cup will be hosted by the Dominican Republic, which will be the tournament's eighth edition. This will be the final edition to feature 16 teams before expanding to 24 teams in 2025 and would also be the final edition to be held biannually. Nigeria are in Group A with the host Dominican Republic, New Zealand and Ecuador. Flamingos will kickstart their campaign against New Zealand on the 16th of October. And that's all on the news at this hour. But before we go, let's take a quick look at some of our major stories. We told you that communities continue to accuse security operatives of killing residents during NBAD governance protest. We also mentioned that Tanzania police arrests opposition figure Tundu Lisu in mass roundup. And finally, families flee countries northeast as wildfire rages in Australia. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. Also follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can watch News Central live on DSTV channel 422, Star Time channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Blessings Masugun.